I'm Elizabeth Shanahan Jewett, and this is Local Matters. I hope this week has been good to you. Let's talk about what's happening in our area. History buffs travel to the South Shore of Massachusetts from all over the world to explore our historic land, homes, and buildings. Living here, we're used to that. But do you know all the stories behind some of our most famous faces and places? On September 14th, the Plymouth Public Library invites you to an author talk with Zachary Lamoth, writer of the book, A History Lover's Guide to the South Shore. Join Mr. Lamoth as he tells the tales behind some of our most notable landmarks and the people who made them famous, including the birthplace of Abigail Adams, Old Situate Light, and much more. The stories unfold at 7 p.m. To register for this in-person event, visit the Plymouth Public Library's website. Rising to the challenges presented by a global pandemic has been demanding for all of us, but for people living with disabilities, the effects have been especially difficult. The effect of limited social networks and extreme isolation can be devastating for those who rely on highly specialized programs and direct interactive support to be safe, learn, work, and perform daily living skills. Julie Thompson spoke with disabilities advocate Lauren Ricciardi to get her perspective. We're so pleased to have Lauren with us. Lauren, would you go right ahead and introduce yourself, please? Thank you. So as you may know, my name is Lauren Ricciardi. I'm 25 years old and I reside from Carver, Massachusetts. I have an autism spectrum disorder and I was diagnosed at 18 months. So what it's like from the very beginning is that after when I was diagnosed with autism, I had slow progress with communication in my early ages. I didn't know how to cope with my frustration and anxiety. I tend to cry and scream a lot, especially in school. But the teachers were supportive with me throughout the times, which was good. But it can be like, it took me quite some time until like I was a preteen. I grew out of those behaviors. And um, when I was like, um, when I was a teenager, I, um, I did, um, I did experience um, social awkwardness. So I did make friends quite easily. Mm -hmm. It's just that if someone doesn't give me enough attention and towards other friends that they hang out with, it can be awkward. Right. And it does make me feel excluded sometimes. Okay. Let, let me High ask... school was, was even difficult. Okay, let, let's, let's talk about that for one sec, because you said you, you grew out of some of the behaviors um, that you had as a younger child. But it's clearly, it's still, it's difficult to navigate personalities and um, situations that you're in. How do you teach other people how to communicate and, and, and interact with you to lessen that happening? So if I knew somebody who has the same disability and is going through the same issues, like sometimes I would um, tell them my stories. Maybe that'll give them inspiration how to, how to get through those challenges. So you just said that if you meet someone else who has um, a disability or is on the spectrum as you are, it's, it's easier for you to communicate and you can probably sometimes help them. In your everyday life when you, you deal with people all the time and you communicate with people all the time, how do you adjust your communication style to people who don't understand what you have? I would explain to them about my feelings. Mm -hmm. if, if I do feel excluded, then I would just speak out to them. Or uh, okay. So you're very open. You're very open about it. Now you used to speak, or before the pandemic, you spoke often in public about your situation. What was the goal of that, and who did you speak to? So, I started speaking with my um, with my sister Shelby, 
William spoke through um, the DDS or Disabil Developmental Disability Service. Yep. So I were, we, so what we, so what we did was we spoke about our lives living with autism. I, we spoke, we spoke at different events through DDS. Mm -hmm. So just to, and just to teach um, people who wanted to work with people with disabilities, what it's like mm -hmm. having a disability. Right. And how to teach them how to how to um, work with them properly. Excellent. And did you find that that was helpful to the audience that listened to you? Absolutely. That's great. That's wonderful. Tell me a little bit about your artwork because you you're a, quite a prolific artist. So I all so it all started when I was like probably like eight years old. I started drawing pictures. So. The very first thing that I would draw when I was little are tigers mm -hmm. because I was obsessed with tigers back then and I still love them. Mm -hmm. And then I started drawing pictures of myself and and I also like I took some art classes in the middle school and I learned how to I learned how to shade. Mm -hmm come up with different shades of color. And does does art help you express how you're feeling? It does. So it's an outlet. It's a really good outlet for you. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you encourage other people to use art that maybe people that are on the spectrum? Does that help? Oh, yes. Especially if they want to learn how to draw. Mm hmm Sometimes I would give them basic lessons. Very nice of you. That's very sweet. And you work? I do. Okay, do you work every day, oh. full time? Well, I used to work at, well, my previous job was at the Carver Middle High School. Mm -hmm. So I worked with a former teacher of mine who was, a, who was, um, a teacher at the post program. Mm -hmm. She asked me if I if I can help her out during the spring until summer break. So I got I got some experience working with kids with special needs, Excellent. and it's a great experience. Excellent. I bet you were very helpful. Oh yes. Yeah. And what they do appreciated you appreciated my help? Yeah, I bet they did. And what do you look forward to once this pandemic is over? So I look forward to getting a job, try to get back to retailing, mm -hmm. and as well as selling my artwork again. Very good. And do you have advice for people who are watching this that have a, an intellectual disability? What advice would you give them? So my advice, like if they're like, if they were about to um, um, get out of school or um, turn 22, mm -hmm. I would say um, use your use your skills that you've already learned. It's and it's okay to feel sad or um, or maybe angry at the changes, maybe. Mm -hmm. But work through but them. them. Yeah, and think. And, um, and just learn, use the, um, use the skills that you already have and, and what else? Well, that's, that's, that's really good you, because you're saying that you, you identify who you are, what skills you have, use the skills that you have and always learn new skills of coping, right? Yes. Yeah. And your words of advice to people that do not have intellectual disabilities. Um, I, I had a very dear friend and person that I respect very highly said to me, first, you always assume competence. Of anyone that has any kind of a disability, assume competence. Is that what you think people should do when they look at anyone that has any kind of intellectual disability? Yes. 
Okay, excellent. So thank you so much for joining us today, Lauren. We've really appreciated it and best of luck to you and your artwork in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren and Julie. It's time to plan for the Medicare Advantage and Drug Plan Open Enrollment, which begins on October 15th. Check your mail. You'll be getting information about any changes in coverage to your current plan or assistance in paying for prescription drugs. Take the time to read through what is covered in your current plan because cost, coverage, providers, and pharmacies in your network can also change. You can review your own healthcare visit information, review payments and claims, view your preventative benefits, and print your medication lists by going online and visiting www.medicare.gov. And to get local assistance, call your town's senior center, where a representative from SHINE is eager to help you. SHINE is an acronym for Serving the Health Insurance Needs of Everyone and provides free, unbiased counseling information and assistance to Massachusetts residents with Medicare, their caregivers, and those approaching Medicare eligibility. Statewide, there are more than 600 certified volunteer counselors trained and ready to assist you. Open enrollment runs from October 15th through December 7th. In partnership with the Plymouth 400 official Maritime Salute on Saturday, September 4th, the Plymouth Philharmonic Orchestra will prevent a free outdoor music event in historic Pilgrim Memorial State Park on the Plymouth waterfront near the Plymouth Rock Portico. Featuring music for all ages, concert highlights include an orchestral suite from Handel's famous water music, vintage film music from Eric Korngold's score to the Seahawk, and sea shanty sung by acclaimed baritone Philip Lima. In keeping with the maritime theme, the orchestra will perform pirate-inspired music featuring Leroy Anderson's Pirate Dance, the overture to Gilbert and Sullivan's comic operetta, The Pirates of Penzance, and a swashbuckling medley of music from the Pirates of the Caribbean films. Stephen Curtianis conducts this special Labor Day weekend concert, the orchestra's first performance since March 2020. It's been 18 long months of silence, says Curitianus, so we're roaring back in grand style. I can't wait until we're all back together again. The music starts at 7.30 p.m. on September 4th and will also be streamed live right here on PAC-TV's community channel, Prime, Comcast 13 or Verizon 43, and on 95.9 WATD. Visit PlymouthPhil.org or call the Phil office at 508-746-8008 to learn more. But don't miss it. Local seniors Ben and Max stopped in at the Plymouth Public Library to talk with Youth Services Librarian Madeline Mahoney. I've always been an avid reader since I was a kid. I lived in walking distance to the library. I think I even went by myself, which I can't even imagine now, kids walking to the library by themselves. But I never really considered it as a career. Um, I went to Stonehill College and I graduated with a degree in elementary education, but realized pretty quickly after I graduated that it wasn't for me. Um, so two, three years into it, I decided to think about libraries. Um, I was working at an independent bookstore at the time and loved working with it with books and I still wanted to work with kids. So I kind of thought that those in a way were a combination of both the things that I love. And uh, yeah, I came here, I've been for here for five years and uh, never looking back. Normally the youth services department is a three person department, but I have spending most of the past year by myself. 
I was doing um, online story times and um, yeah, I would sit actually right where we are right now doing my virtual story times. We actually had an author event recently for the adults and people from like all over the world were at it, which is obviously wouldn't happen in person. So we have a teen advisory group, we also have a tween advisory group, and both of the groups are basically groups to get teens involved in the library, whether it's volunteering or just getting some input in programming. We do read to a dog with a golden retriever named Legend. He is adorable and um, it basically is an opportunity for kids, you know, whether are struggling readers or, you know, um, maybe they're just starting to read, gives them kind of the chance to read in a comfortable environment, you know, someone who's not going to judge them. It's like, it's, it's a dog, um, you know, trained as a therapy dog, so it's not just any dog. Next week, the owner of the dog is bringing also one of his other dogs so that we can have two dogs and uh, it's been a big hit. We're actually going to have children's author Lauren Wolk come. She's um, an author of a Newbery Honor book and she just had a recent book Echo Mountain that came out in the past year and she's actually a Cape Cod native so I'm very looking forward to her coming and that is a uh, that's going to be in September. I'm trying to read for the first time a lot of books that people read that I've never read so there's a series called Warriors that's very popular. I've never read a single one. Um, the Keeper of the Lost Cities um, and uh, Diver of the Wimpy Kid, which again, these are all three of our most popular series and I've never read a single book out of any of them. I am currently I'm listening to Concrete Rose, which is the prequel to The Hate You Give, which was a popular YA book that became a movie. And then I'm also about to read Ink Heart by Cornelia Funk, which is again a popular uh, middle grade book. My new favorite book for children's is called The Mari and the Night Brothers. It kind of have been um, promoting it as if you liked Harry Potter, it's like a magical school, except your powers are given to you at the school instead of you're born with them. And it uh, has like a diverse cast of characters and uh, it's gonna be a series. I appreciate all the support that everyone has been giving, whether you did curbside or you were coming in for appointments. We've appreciated it so much and I hope to see you in the children's room this summer or any of our programs, whether it's at the library or out in Plymouth. Visit the Plymouth Public Library website to keep up to date on what's happening at your library. Have you recently purchased a new laptop, tablet, or smartphone and have some questions? Tech guru Monique Vigneault has answers for you. On Wednesdays at the Duxbury Senior Center, Ms. Vigneault will be available for 30-minute consults scheduled between 2 and 4 p.m. With ever new technology, there's always more to learn. Please call the front desk at 781-934-5774, extension 5703, to schedule your appointment. The USS Plunkett was an integral part of the US defense against Germany during World War II. But on one ill-fated day in 1944, the ship was struck by German bombers, sustaining one of the most terrifying attacks the Navy had seen by Germany up until that point. Through Navy logs, war diaries, letters, and other documents, author James Sullivan unravels the stories of five soldiers in his book, Unsinkable, Five Men and the Indomitable Run of the USS Plunkett. On September 9th at 7 p.m., join Mr. Sullivan as he speaks about the historical account of what happened on that tragic day. This free in-person event is the first program of Fall Author Talks at the Kingston Council on Aging, but registration takes place through the Kingston Public Library. Visit the library's website to learn more. The Boy Scouts of America's highest rank attainable is Eagle Scout status, a rank achieved by only 4% of Scouts. The local scene visited with Jaden Main on Emerson Field in Plymouth to talk about his service project that made the field a more welcoming place. I started playing baseball when I was seven years old. What I really think is so special about baseball is that it's mainly just like a team activity and it, it's just all about teamwork and how hard everybody tries and it's not really an individual thing. Everybody is devoted to the whole team. I used to play at Emerson Field when I was young but it was one of those backup fields where the coaches didn't really want it, the players didn't really want it, the parents didn't really want it. So I decided to take that on to my ego project and make it better, to, to make it one of those fields that people like. Bleachers, the dugouts, uh, the shed, the snack shack, it was all just completely run down. First got involved with Boy Scouts just when I was in uh, first grade. It just grows on you as you keep going out throughout life. Boy Scouts, it helps you become a better person and it trains you for your adulthood. It can change your life and 
it looks good on a job application. All throughout Boy Scouts, I already knew what my ego project, what I wanted it to be, and I just knew it wanted to be something for baseball, but I didn't know exactly what, so I reached out to Mike Ruggiero and I asked him, hey, is there anything I can do? And then he said, Emerson Baseball Field needs some cleaning up to do, so I took that on. I had some help doing the field with a couple of my friends, and what I did was I repainted the bleachers, the dugout, the snack shacks, just cleaned it up a little bit, and made a new sign for out front. It felt pretty good after I finished the Eagle Project and even hearing all like my teachers and my friends and my friends' parents telling me about how they heard about my work and it just made me like really proud knowing that I really changed my community. The biggest contributors were both my parents because they're the ones that gave me the rides, helped me with the materials that I needed and helped me get everything set up. It was a team effort with me and all my friends and my family, just everybody that I got help from because it wasn't just me alone. Way to go, Jaden. Speaking of baseball, there's more. Join Howie Newman, local singer, songwriter, and former sports writer for a musical baseball show on September 14th at the Pembroke Public Library from 6 to 7 p.m. In this interactive and highly entertaining program, Howie Newman will sing baseball songs, offer up baseball trivia, and tell stories about his days as a sports writer on the Red Sox beat. You'll remember Howie from his baseball coverage in the Patriot Ledger, Lowell Sun, Lynn Item, and Boston Globe, as well as several other newspapers and magazines. Take yourself out to the baseball show. No registration is required. Visit the Pembroke Public Library website to learn more. Next up, we have storyteller Robin Galinsky with her observations and advice on parenting your children, who are now adults. You know what no one ever talks about that I can see? No one ever talks about what it's like to parent adult children. You're still, you never stop being a parent, right? But they all love to talk about the pregnancy, the babies, the toddlers, even, you know, big kids they'll talk about. But that's the cakewalk. It really is. I used to think teenage years were the hardest but it's not. There's a developmental leap required of mothers that no one talks about that comes from when your child goes from a child to an adult. Now, I just said that as if it's, you know, like a step in the process. Like, oh, yesterday they weren't walking. Today they took their steps. They're walking. Adulthood doesn't work like that. It's like this long, slow ramp and it keeps going, and with boys it can be for even longer, but I have girls. The best advice I can give you about raising adult children, or I shouldn't say raising, <laughs> parenting adult children, is if you see something, say nothing. You know, we all heard the terrorist, you know, if you see something, say something about terrorists. Well, children are their own form of terrorists, okay? Because the definition of a terrorist is they, they do things that create fear in people. Well, children are very good at doing things that create nothing but sheer terror and fear in their mother. But the advice is different. If you see something, say nothing. It begins with those college years, right? They're not adults yet, but they think they are. And legally, they are, but it's just means they can get into a whole lot more trouble and there's not you have a whole lot less influence over that best thing you can do in in those years is keep your mouth shut so you're gonna have a, a teenager who can't wait to get away from you and it is bittersweet part of you is sad that they've grown and then part of you is like what can I do with that room that empty room so that they don't come back. So <laughs> you have mixed emotions. But when they go to college and then they come home for that first visit, often that's a rough visit because they're, all of a sudden they know way more than you. Now they always knew more than you, but this is, they know way more than you now. Um, in fact, you're totally, you're a total idiot. Uh, everything you're doing is wrong and they're just fired up, you know probably with social causes and and big strong opinions about what's wrong with the world and how everything could be fixed if, if only we did this. 
it's best just to say nothing because um, even if they say something very provocative and very disturbing to you, trust me, it'll change. It'll pass. So there's no point in getting yourself worked up about it. Now you get the kid launched, right? And they go out and they're, they're now go through, I think they're between the ages of like 21, 22 to 26. Those are years a lot of people don't talk about where they are all of a sudden faced with reality. <laughs> Good old reality. Um, all their opinions and stuff, all of their lip service about why, why don't you do it this way? Why they come to find out life is about sitting on hold, listening to bad music, then getting disconnected. It's about phone trees. It's about paperwork and forms. It's about bureaucracy and processes. All of these things that my daughter, uh, when she was 17, told me was my lifestyle choice. I chose to sit on hold. She wasn't going to choose that. Yeah, that was a funny moment. So he, now she's now in that world. And this is where, when I say, if you see something, say nothing. This is where you have to control your laughter. You have to control your, even your just smiling. Because watching them with the shock and the horror, realizing what being an adult is. And it's not, it's not a temporary situation it's permanent you're now an adult from here till the end and that is quite a shock and a lot of young adults have a lot of trouble with that and let's face it we all know people who never grow up right they just never grow up best to say nothing and then have a laugh to yourself now we get to parenthood when your child becomes a parent that's some next level stuff. And we talk about it in a cheesy way. You know, we got plaques and buttons and all kinds of things for it, but it's it's a it's a big deal. Whoever your child chooses to have a child with, you have to accept. They're now part of the family. See, I think it's a good idea to have arranged marriages. I I, I now see the wisdom in that as the control freak that I am. I would like to hand pick that person. But I've been fortunate in that my daughter did pick somebody amazing. Thank God. But it's a crapshoot. You never know what you're going to get, right? And you have to say nothing. You have to say nothing. Because if you say something, you could destroy that relationship. So now my daughter has a baby. And now I'm in a new level. A brand new level of if you see something, say nothing. Because, of course, I am bursting at my seams with advice and insight and wisdom. And I I just, like, it's I'm dying to share it. But I do it this much. You know, you got to think about it like a pinch of cayenne pepper in the recipe. Because too much says I... I know more than you, you don't know what you're doing, and it, it, it goes south quickly. It does not help the situation. So that's the best advice I can give you on parenting adult children. It's not easy, and it doesn't end. Sage advice. Thank you, Robin. And thank you for staying with us for this episode of Local Matters. From all of us at PAC TV. Have a happy and safe week. We will see you next time.
Thank you for watching. We are grateful for your attention. If you like what you saw, please like and subscribe to The Local Scene here and share everywhere. Thank you, friends.